And so I think because of that, and then me sending over some tactical, here's 20 things I would do for your brand if I started working for you now. You almost have to like pretend that you have the job and that's when they can really start envisioning, oh gosh, this person's legit. They have really good ideas and they're already got, they've got skin in the game here. I think that's impressive as a, as a leader or an employer. That's what we all want is that kind of initiative out of a team member. So I think that coupled with the mutual connections really helped at least get me another phone call. And then it's mm. like, okay, how do I ace this phone call? So I was researching everything about Ramsey that I could because I knew on that phone call, I need to know my stuff. If the HR guy thinks, well, he's just looking for a J-O-B, I'm not going to get the job here because we're more than about J-O-Bs at Ramsey. You got to be bought in on the mission. And so that was the next step and then the next step. And so as I progressed, you know, you get a little more rope and a little more trust. Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I'm so glad you joined us. Hey, if you're new here, make sure you subscribe. That way you'll never miss an episode. Today, it's George Camel. You may know him from the Ramsey Channel, the Ramsey Show. Uh, George went from a negative net worth to millionaire in less than... 10 years. And he talks all about it. And we also talk about how he became an influencer when he started at the very bottom of the hierarchy at the Ramsey organization. So I think young leaders, you're really going to enjoy it. Speaking of things you'll enjoy, check out my first ever live event. It's happening in Dallas, Texas in September. You're invited. It's called The Art of Leadership Live. I would love for you to join me. It's going to be a select curated group of people, lots of interaction with me and with others. Make sure you check it out at The Art of leadershiplive.com. And how do you cut through the noise when you're trying to really get the attention of your church? You can join 17,000 other churches who use Subsplash to create a way to cut through the noise online so you can communicate with your people. You can visit subsplash.com slash carry and get $500 off to get started. And in the meantime, here is my conversation with George Camel. George, this is long overdue. Welcome. It's such an honor to be here, Kerry, inside of this podcast, because I once worked with you on this podcast, which maybe we'll get into later. No, we'll start right there. I don't think that uh, there would be a podcast if it wasn't for George Camel. So a lot of people know you now as a Ramsey personality, an author. You've got your first book out, etc. It's been a rocket ride that we're going to break down step by step, uh, especially for the young leaders. But you and I met 10 years ago in 2014, when I was noodling around launching a podcast and I didn't have the bandwidth to do it all myself. So I reached out to a mutual friend who at that time worked at Ramsey and he said, I'm putting a crew together. And will you pick up the story from there? Oh, absolutely. I was kind of a marketing consultant as a side hustle as I was trying to pay off debt and work through my financial journey. And a good friend of mine and coworker was like, hey, I'll hire you to help out. We're helping authors and entrepreneurs and speakers kind of launch their platforms and books and podcasts. Uh-huh. And I went, That's, that sounds awesome. And so one of the first clients that he had was this guy, this Canadian guy, Kerry Newhoff, that was this pastor slash leadership slash blogger slash podcaster. And I remember creating the first ever show notes for your first ever podcast and your first ever book and helping mm-hmm. you launch that. And uh, look at you now, Gary. You stand on the shoulders of tiny giants like me, I feel like. <laughs> well, I certainly stand on the shoulder of a lot of people. And George, you're one of them. I got to tell you, that was really cool though. So how long had you been at Ramsey in 2014? That was, I've been here over 10 years now. So I started in mm-hmm. 2013 at Ramsey as an intern and that was, I was side hustling my way through debt payoff from 2013 to 15. Wow. So you were uh, barely at Ramsey. You started a side hustle just for a little bit of extra pin money to get that debt down. And what were you doing at Ramsey at the time in 2014 when I met you? So I came on uh, to help one of our mutual friends, John Acuff. He was one of the original Ramsey personalities back before we even called them that. And I was a big fan of John's work with his blog and stuff Christians like. And so I heard he worked for this guy named Dave and I was tweeting at him being like, I want to work with you, like hire me. And so I had already graduated from college, so I couldn't do a true internship. It's illegal, apparently. You got to do it for like college credit to be an official internship. And so they found me a temp job because John was like, hey, this guy's got what it takes. I think he should come on. We'll give him this kind of, he can kind of intern for me, but then we'll find him a temp job here. So I was a temp in the social media side, helping with our tech recruiting, hiring developers, running that social media side, helping John with his social media 
And that was my first foray at Ramsey. Uh, it was kind of my foot in the door until I got a full-time role after the internship was over. And we both said, hey, I like it here. You guys hopefully like me. Is there a full-time role? And so I stepped into email marketing as a coordinator full-time in 2013. And that was my first salary job out of college. Right out of college. Okay, so this is fascinating. I did not, I either didn't know or don't, didn't remember the ACUF connection because I'm talking to John all the time, right? Off mic. You we, got a traveling, speaking together a bunch. Yeah, we do a call every month just to catch up, see what's new with each other. And I want to break this down because I hear from young leaders all the time who want to get the kind of breakthrough today that you had back in 2013. So, you know, they're tweeting at somebody or DMing them now on Instagram or following them on TikTok. And it's like, how do I get into the sphere of John Acuff? And John Acuff already had a profile. I mean, he did stuff Christians like. He had a book on that. He was a Ramsey personality. He had probably one or two New York Times bestsellers by then. Yeah. And you're like a John Acuff fan. So what did you do as this college student hoping to get a break? Man, well, you know, it. Uh, Ken Coleman, our friend, has a book called The Proximity yep. Principle. And I uh -huh. accidentally followed those principles where you get around the right people who have the right connections. And it was less about my degree. I had a little degree, this communication degree from a tiny private Christian school in Mobile, Alabama. It wasn't my degree that got me there, my intellect or my talent. It was just who I knew plus persistence plus work ethic. And so it started as my roommate Judson got a message from Jeremy Coward. He made oh, yeah. a website called like Judson wants to work with Jeremy.com. And it was this amazing pitch to be, to work with Jeremy as an intern. So John Acuff is friends with Jeremy. He sees that and he messages Judson and he's like, Hey, on Twitter DM, I need like a hustler guy like you. And so Judson mentioned my name. He didn't tell me any of this happened. Weeks later, he goes, Oh yeah, I messaged Acuff and mentioned your name. And I was like, you mentioned my name to John Acuff? So I started DMing John. I was like, I think my friend might have mentioned me. I would, I'd love to work with you. Here's my resume. Here's what I could do for you. And so that turned into, you know, a phone call with HR to, to get a foot in the door. And I put my best foot forward with a strategic plan about what we could do to help grow John's social impact. And, you know, they saw that kind of hustle and grind out of a 23-year-old and went, let's give him a shot. Wow. So I moved to Nashville for Mobile for that internship. What was your pitch? Do you remember the first time you talked to John? Like, because it's one thing, you know, where he meets you and kind of goes, oh, yeah, yeah, good guy, but we're moving on. Do you remember what the quality or the content of that conversation was like the first time you got into an interaction with John Acuff? I remember being such a fan of his. And so it started with appreciation for what he did. Mm -hmm. It was rarely about me and my accolades, because truthfully, I didn't really have any as a college student. I graduated you know, from here's a my college work. you've never heard of. Exactly. A man of small intellect. Well, uh, you know what he did? He kidding, did speak not. at our college. And so that okay. was a connection point because he had spoken at the college. And so that was one piece of, you know, finding any connective tissue you can to mm -hmm. that person that you're mm -hmm. trying to reach out to is huge. Appreciating them and then going, here's how I think I can add value to your life versus what can you give to me? Can you mentor me? Nobody, when you hear those words, you go, oh, this guy's going to suck all my time and energy. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's, hey, here's how I'm dreaming about adding value to what you're already doing. Uh, tell me about your goals and do those align with what I'm thinking. And so I think because of that, and then me sending over some tactical, here's 20 things I would do for your brand if I started working for you now. You wow. almost have to like pretend that you have the job. And that's when they can really start envisioning, oh gosh, this person's legit. They have really good ideas and they're already got, they've got skin in the game here. I think that's impressive as a, as a leader or an employer. That's what we all want is that kind of initiative out of a team member. So I think that coupled with the mutual connections really helped at least get me another phone call. And then it's mm. like, okay, how do I ace this phone call? So I was researching everything about Ramsey that I could because I knew on that phone call, I need to know my stuff. If the HR guy thinks, well, he's just looking for a J-O-B, I'm not going to get the job here because we're more than about J-O-Bs at Ramsey. You got to be bought in on the mission. And so that was the next step. And then the next step. And so as I progressed, you know, you get a little more rope and a little more trust. And my goal was just to be, how can I be so faithful in whatever's in front of me and do it with excellence and do it with such a work ethic that nobody could ever look at that and go, well, that guy's, he doesn't have what it takes. He's lazy. 
Wow. Okay. That was like a two minute masterclass on how to pitch people. There's my TED Uh, talk for you. There it is. Now, would you nuance that for the way things work today? I mean, I can't think of anything you would change, but I mean, obviously that was very effective a decade ago. Um, For the young leaders listening right now who are hoping to get in with someone like Mm. a John Acuff or a Dave Ramsey, any way that you would say, hey, in 2024, the game's changed and here's how it's changed. Yeah, I'm thinking now because I'm sort of in John Acuff's seat, which is so fascinating to go Mm -hmm. from doing the social media help for the personality to being the personality. So I'm thinking if someone DM me, um, what you don't want is something super long-winded. You know, I think DM is still a, a great way to do it, but I do think having a connection point is really good. And so saying, hey, I bought your book or I went through this course that you did or I saw you at on the stage here, that helps me go, oh, this is a real person. This isn't some person a thousand miles away who has no mm-hmm. connection point who's pitching me on why they I need to be their, you know, sort of international editor from Malaysia. Because I get a lot of those, Carrie. I don't know why. They're always <laughs> pitching me. Like, we can help you scale your business. I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't I even get have a business, man. Every day. My team keeps most of them out of my inbox, like 98% Good. of them. But like, I'll, once in a while, someone will get my number and I'm like, I'm not even answering that. Like, I, I don't know how to answer that. Like, yes, yeah. that's a good team. I think what back in 2013, the difference was, you know, we we didn't have a huge company. We've gone from hmm. 300 people to over a thousand. And so there's more procedure and there's more, you know, we have better processes and things. And so I'd probably tell them, hey, apply through the website if you want this role, because a role has to kind of exist already. So you kind of have to know they're already looking for help, which I knew John needed already based on his DMs. It's funny how, you know, and I think at whatever level you're at, you're probably still cold pitching from time to time. I wrote an email last week for a guest I really want to have on the podcast. It's probably going to happen this year. And my team had reached out and we got a, hey, check back in a few months, which is not a no, which is good. But I thought I wanted this guy to let him know, I don't want to say who it was, how much I appreciated him. And I didn't have a point of mutual interest other than other guests I've had on the podcast. And I was hesitant to ask those people for an introduction. So I happened to get his personal email address from my team. And I just sent him a note. And I just said, hey, I just want you to know, we don't know each other, but I'm really grateful for you. I've read your two books. This one in particular really spoke to me. Here's what I learned. One, Mm. two, three. Um, uh, we're looking at possibly having you on the podcast. That would be great. Gave my download count, told him all of his friends that had been on the podcast. Uh, I know you're busy. Just want to know I'm grateful and hopefully we can do this later this year. And he got back to me within a couple of hours and said, would totally love to do this. Thank you. This really meant a lot. Let's circle back in August with a very specific date. Yeah, yes. I'm like, now I've got that diarized. I'm not going to bug him between now and August, but now I'm going to follow up in worked. August. I think it did. I think it cut through the noise and the crap rather than just, here's what I want you to do for me. It's like, I've read your stuff. Yes. And one of the books I'm reading for the third time, and that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> like, wow. I loved it that much. So you showed him, hey, I value what you're doing. Here's a specific mm-hmm. thing. I've, I've engaged and interacted with your content. And then here's my ask. Just make it yep. very clear instead of this vague thing. Uh, yep. And I love that. You said, hey, would you be on my podcast? Here's the details. Here's some specific dates. I love making things tactical because it's one less brain calorie for that person to burn. Well, and I could offer him an audience too, right? As opposed to, and sometimes people do you favors. Like, you know, Andy Stanley was kind enough to be episode one on my show when we had zero downloads. You did the show notes for that one, right? Yes. And that was a great so- episode. Oh, it was a great episode. Yeah, he was great. Came out the not, gate strong. Wasn't used to doing 40-minute interviews, you know, on podcasts. That was new back in the day, believe it or not. There was no Joe Rogan, I don't think, wow. in 2014. And yeah, nobody in the doing it space. on the cusp of like, you were one of the first great kind of leadership podcasts doing these longer form interviews. Well, in the church space, I think I was first, other than maybe Catalyst. And everybody wow. told me it wouldn't work because everyone has tiny attention spans. But hey, here we are a decade and later. And almost three-hour episodes at number one. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So when you got to Ramsey, uh, I mean, I'm going to guess, did you ever think you would be on air with Ramsey? Or what was your ambition or your career plan? And if you did think you would be, like, it's okay to say that. 
Yeah, well, I wish I had some grand scheme, like I'm going to work my way into an internship and get, become a personality. I really did not think it was in the cards for me, Carrie. I came from a background of being a musician and I was used to being on, on stage and even in front of cameras for fun little video. You know, I, I was going to go into film and be a filmmaker out of college. That was a dream of mine. So I always loved video and even being on camera, behind the camera, on stage, playing music, entertaining people. That was always something I enjoyed doing, but I never saw it as a career path that I could pursue where I could just go, yeah, I'm just going to go be a personality. That's easy. And so I was always the guy behind the scenes helping those people make it happen. Right. Even helping speakers and authors like you. I just loved helping people with a great message, communicate it in an interesting and creative way. That was really, to me, I still do that today. I'm just now also the mouthpiece for it, which is mm. cool. But nothing's really changed in that regard. But what changed for me was um, I got that email marketing job. I convinced them by buying a book called HTML and CSS on Amazon. And I read the book and that was sort of my, I could do this job here. I read this book and they gave me a shot. And so at every moment, at every next opportunity, I just did whatever it took to learn that skill and then prove to them that I could do it over time. And so that email marketing position turned into another uh, the first official social media marketer for personalities in 2016. Oh, wow. And you know Ken Coleman from the Catalyst days and now yep. as a Ramsey personality. I had known Ken from the Catalyst days and he had spoken at a previous company I worked for. And so I got to know him. I traded him. I filmed his Catalyst video, edited it, and I traded him for uh, free tickets to Catalyst in exchange for filming his talk so that he could watch back the tape and learn and grow and use that. So that was my first interaction with Ken. Little did I know one day he'd be a Ramsey personality here and I would be taking the torch from him to MC and host our live events, host a video channel. And so that was my first step from normal marketer guy into public figure face for the company. And that was a big transition too. Guy in the cubicle, guy in the closet, you know, typing away to a personality. So how did that, how did that happen? Why? Because I think it was as a host that you were first tapped, right? Yes. Yeah, so... The situation was Ken was looking to move into this personality role. He had this message about work and career that he wanted to pursue at Ramsey, but there was a problem. We needed someone to replace Ken. And if you've ever seen Ken Coleman on stage hosting Catalyst, hosting podcasts, he is so good at that role, at hosting and emceeing. So just to fill Ken's shoes is difficult. And so we do this event every year at Ramsey called Battle of the Bands, and it is what you think it is. Our team members form musical bands and do cover songs, and then we all vote for winners, and it's this big rock and roll show. And so I was in these, in these, uh, in the competition for years, Carrie, three times in a row, did not win with my mm -hmm. bands. And so I was tired of losing, number one. And the hosting truly was abysmal at the time. It was any warm body in the company could get up there and try to make a transition between the bands. And it was so cringy, and I just thought, man, I think I could do that and do it better. Not out of a place of ego, but just out of like, I could add value to this event, this event that I love and care about. I have the music background. It'll be fun to poke fun at the bands in a light way and carry the show. And so I raised my hand multiple times with persistence until they finally went, okay, sure, you can host next year. And so I put my all into that. We made creative videos. We did musical parodies. We did competitions and game show type things to really bring a whole new element to this show. And they saw me on stage. And I think that was the light bulb moment where Ken and a few of the leaders went, hmm, what if that guy hosted our live events? Mm. He believes in this place. He loves the mission. He loves the people. He represents us well. Let's give him a shot. And so that's when I got tapped on the shoulder and I about fell out of my chair because my leader came to me and said, hey, we're going to this marketing conference in San Diego, but I need you to take notes as if it's for someone else. And I was like, what? He's like, it's going to be for someone else because you're going to backfill Ken Coleman. I literally thought they was talking to someone behind me. I was like, you're talking to me. Like, I'm going to be the guy to go on stage and do the video channel. And they went, yeah, we think you can do this. And so having a leader that believes in you is one of the most powerful things in the world. Like a, a, a good manager is fine. A good leader helps you become better at life and sees things in you that maybe you don't even see in you. And so that was such a huge transitional moment in my life in early 2017 to start to get trained up to take on that role. So there was something you said as though it was natural and inevitable that I don't think is natural and inevitable. So the hosting had been, let's just call it lackluster at previous Battle of the Bands. And then when you got tapped on the shoulder to do this, 
you could have just said, well, I'll just, you know, spend an hour on this prep for it. And the bar is low enough that I can probably just do it and get away with it and be good. But you went and you made social media, you uh, did all kinds of video for it, and you treated that like somebody had tapped you on the shoulder to host the Oscars or something like that. Can you, what was it in you? First of all, can you say what you did? And secondly, you made up some rules, which is something leaders do, right? Like you're just like, well, nobody told me I couldn't. So I think Mm. I will. I'd love you to break that down a little bit because I think that's another way to kind of stand out from the crowd and get noticed. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think you're right. I I tend to just take things too far as far as like what we could do. And I tend to break right. the rules and push the envelope and all of that stuff, not out of a wanting to rebel, but instead it's a vision of what could be. And mm. my goal on that stage was what is going to get the laugh? It was a true sort of comedian's heart of what's going to get the laugh, what's going to connect with this audience and what's going to create a moment. And so through that process, I I would tap people on the shoulder that I trusted and say, hey, you're a designer. Can you help me design this slide? It's going to be a really funny thing. Hey, video guy, can you just help me like during lunch and make this video? I have this idea that I think could be really funny. So what we would do is take these kind of zeitgeist of Ramsey as a whole and said, what are the things that we all know to be true, but no one is sort of saying out loud that will be funny without offending, you know, HR? I don't want to be in the HR office being like, you can't say that but what is just over the line that we all know to be true. And so there was always those kind of moments where I'm quick to make fun of myself, which I think gives me the, awards me the ability to make fun of others too. I'm, you know, Mm. it's sort of an equal uh, opportunity offender there. And so I I always love that self-deprecation, but also like not taking ourselves too seriously. And so it became parody ad videos. We would do fake sponsors. And so I would make these fake sponsorship videos of, Today's video is brought to you by, and it would be some internal thing that we all had this sort of awareness of um, that always got a laugh out of the crew. And we would we made up a, a, a amusement park called Ramsey Land. When we were building this new building, I said, hey, they're going to actually put an amusement park. It's called Ramsey Land. Here's some of the rides. And all of the rides had to do with funny internal things like procurement. We all know the procurement team. They're very methodical, but goodness, they can move slow. So we called it the procurement plunge. And we kind of had this pipe analogy. And I was like, sometimes stuff gets stuck in the pipes over in procurement. And, you know, so there's just funny in really inside baseball stuff that no one would find funny except for the people at Ramsey. But all of that kind of elevated the whole experience to where people didn't just look forward to the bands. They looked forward to the hosting and what the comedic bits were going to be and the stuff that I was going to make fun of from the year past. And so the, it just became outrageous and uh, over the top. And I think that made me want to up the ante every year. So one year I rode in on a camel. We, I, I was dressed as Aladdin. Remember it was that. It was the year that COVID happened. And so we made a whole video about how my one wish is that Battle of the Bands could still happen during COVID. And so we did it outside. We hired a camel. I got on top of the camel. It played Prince Ali as I rode in. And it was just these like, what could just be a moment? And so that's how I've always treated everything is how can I take it to the next level? How can I make this more creative and connect with people on a deep level? And so you're doing that while your day job was still email marketing. Yes, that was the difficult part, Gary. Truthfully, it became so... Every year, the most stressful thing was Battle of the Bands because I Mm. knew how much of my life I would have to pour into this and how many extra hours I would have to pour into it. But it was also a joy. And you know, you've had those things where you're like, I'm willing to spend four nights this week working on this. Uh, So that would really... It became... It just got to the point where I couldn't do it anymore once I stepped into all the other hosting roles and personality roles, it just became too much to where I had to finally let go and delegate it. But I, it's still one of my favorite events we do all year. And I try to make a cameo when I can. That's great. And you know, you're, you're embracing or embodying what uh, I think Seth Godin calls pick yourself, right? Mm. A lot of people are waiting to be picked, but you not only pick yourself, you went over and above any category anyone had seen for hosting an event like that and made it amazing. And I'm just thinking for young leaders, you know, you mentioned you get pitched every day. Yeah, we do. And sometimes I do see some of the pitches because they'll slide into Instagram and it's like, hey, I got a video company and we'd love to do your reels or hey, I'd love this. You know what no one's ever done? To my knowledge, maybe they have and it didn't make it to me. 
If somebody had pitched me and said, hey, I have some expertise in video. I took five of your YouTube videos and condense them into reels that I think will elevate your brand. Here's the link. And then they show me a finished product of the five reels. Guess That's what? Impressive. My team would take a serious look at them. But if it's like, hey, we just think we could really help you, it's like, I don't know. We can like, 10X your brand. Yeah, exactly. I get those. It's like, okay, so uh, you're doing email marketing. How did you make the leap from Battle of the Bands to hosting something else? So that became this, uh, you know, once you, I got tapped on the shoulder and they said, hey, you're going to backfill. I was doing mm -hmm. a, a hybrid email and social role for our friend Christy Wright with her business boutique brand at yep. the time. And so that became a transition plan of, okay, we need someone to backfill George now. And then we need George to step into Ken's role. And so it became this hybrid where you're still doing your full-time job while training for the next one. And if you've ever been in that season, a lot of leaders are working multiple jobs and they, they know this life well. But that was a difficult season. It's a scary season because you have a lot to prove. You know, when mm. someone says, I believe in you, now it's like, oh, crap, they believe in me. You know, there's, yeah, there's a yeah. moment of, wow, that's so special. And then there's the, oh, gosh, I got to really step into this well. And so I started uh, preparing for my first ever hosting of an, of an event. And so I would be in the conference center and our old conference center. There would be seven people in the audience from our team kind of watching me audition for this as I was introducing a fake speaker to the stage and, and doing a fake introduction and transition and close for the event and sponsor pitch. And, you know, it's almost embarrassing to do that with seven people in the crowd. You feel like a mm -hmm. crazy person. But that's what it took to get the chops just to get to that point. And my first ever event, I thought they were going to put me in front of like 50 people. Carrie, it was 5,000 people <laughs> at, you know, this huge church in Orlando with Dave Ramsey, big money event. And that was my first, it was kind of an audition gig. It was basically like, hey, if this goes well, you got the job. And right. I remember I walked on stage uh, right before we started and Dave Ramsey walks up to me. And the first thing he does is he unfurls my collar of my suit jacket, which is just all mangled up. <laughs> and I was very unprofessional. And he's just helping me out like a dad who's kind of disappointed. Uh -huh. Just, you know, but very, it was a very sweet moment. And I was like, oh gosh, I need this night to go well. And uh, truthfully, looking back, if you watch the tape, it is, it's embarrassing, but it was enough to get the job. And I've gotten better since then, hopefully, as I then hosted another 100 events over four years at Ramsey. And what was the bump up from host to full-blown personality, sitting in with Dave, filling in for Dave, uh, hosting your own show, hosting your own channels, basically, full-fledged personality? Yeah, even that transition, like we've talked about before, it was one opportunity and I just tried to make that the make the most of that. And so my first real opportunity was hosting our Borrowed Future podcast series. I had this dream of, hey, Ramsey needs to get, like we do caller-driven shows. What if we did a narrative podcast that really dove deep into a topic? And so we had this um, kind of student loan crisis that we were looking yeah, into. I remember that. And I auditioned again to sort of be the host because I had hosted stuff on stage, never had done a real podcast for us. So it was your idea though? And then you auditioned to be the host? We had the, I'm trying to remember, yes, we had this idea of the narrative podcast and then it was perfectly aligned with uh, Anthony O'Neill, our friend, was mm -hmm. doing this book called Debt Free Degree. And so we were like, this is great. It's going to all line up at the same time. And so I was one of the people to audition to host it. And I guess I won the audition. And so... I did a test and they went, yeah, I think he could he could carry this podcast. And so I was not a personality for the podcast. I just sort of carried along with all the narrative pieces and transition pieces. And again, it was long nights and weekends working on that podcast because I wanted it to be excellent. And that turned into hosting our Ramsey education curriculum for the students out there. Our, our personal finance curriculum is now in 48% of high schools. So wow. I got to host that and bring a lot of humor to those scripts. And it was... I think over like 130 scripts or something, something wild just for all of the transitional pieces and elements and things that were needed for that. So I put my whole soul into that. Then there was the fine print podcast where I wanted to dive deep into all of the, the financial system that is designed to keep you broke. And at the time of that launch, they had knighted me personality over the summer of 2021. And so it wasn't just the fine print. It was the fine print with George Camel for the very first time, mm. my name was attached to something as the personality. And it wasn't because of just the opportunities that I seized with excellence. 
It was also because I had diligently followed the Ramsey principles. I had diligently created content that connected with our tribe in new and fun ways. And, you know, you know, my wife and I, Whitney, and we followed the principles. We paid off our house in our early 30s. And we've been preaching this debt-free lifestyle for so long that it almost became, it wasn't really a decision. They just had to relent and go like, okay, he's a personality. Let's right. just call it what, like there was probably some leaders carrying the building who were like, just, they gave up. They gave in and just went, let's just let him do it. And I think that level of persistence and excellence over time and relational, you know, emotional intelligence and relational equity I had built with so many people on this team, all of that plus God is what mm. helped me step into this role, you know, eight, nine, 10 years into this place. And so it's been an amazing journey. And I truly am so grateful and, and humbled by every step of the way. Well, and I want to underscore that too, because it seems like an overnight success. But again, before you really got the title of personality, you were eight years into the job. You'd executed the, you know, breaking free from debt. So I think you were 32 or 33 when you paid yeah. off your house. You and Whitney did, which is amazing. Uh, Dave saw that. He writes about that in the introduction to your book, Breaking Free from Broke, which is incredible. And, uh, you know, the other thing too is you were hustling. It wasn't like, well, you know, I only have 37.5 hours a week. So just, you know, delete 20 hours and I'll do this thing. You were hustling and it's kind of that side hustle. You know, a lot of people call that entrepreneurship. Did mm. you ever get to the point where it felt like it was too much and you wanted to quit? because it was demanding, because your goals were demanding evenings and weekends? Or how did you and Whitney approach that? Because you got married in the midst of it. You became a dad over the last couple of years too. So, yeah. you know. Well, you know, and you know this, Carrie, you talk about this a lot in, in your recent yeah. books and burnout. Like there were times and seasons, especially in book writing, that crush me. I mean, times where it's like, my wife is not a fan of, she loves me, but she does not like me right now. Uh -huh. Because of my lack of time management, which I've, I need to, I have learned from you. I need to implement more from you, Carrie, on that, in that regard. You're so good at that. And I've told you when you came to speak at, to our Ramsey team, you hit me square in the face with your uh, great talk on that. But that's been a, a real challenge for me this past year, stepping into fatherhood and now becoming an author. And you know what it takes to write a book. And so it was nights and weekends and sorry, I'm, too focused or too frazzled to help with this thing or go do that thing or do that social uh, obligation. And so that's been a really tough challenge for us. And now being on the other side, we're very grateful. And my wife now sees the fruits of, you know, all the work that was put into that. But that's been kind of the new challenge for me is not what's the next thing and next book and I want to go do this now. It's how do I just be present? How do I be content? How do I slow down instead of mm -hmm. how do I speed up? Because both in our financial goals, in our career goals, everything was just, what's the next thing? Okay, what's the next thing? All right, we're going to do this. Then we're going to pay off the house. Then we're going to... And my, it was just a, product, a, you know, a list of productivity. And I've realized I'm not good at rest. I don't know how to say no. And so that, this is the new chapter I'm in now into fatherhood where I'm like, I just need to put my phone down and stare into my daughter's eyes for an hour and just play with her. And that's not productive but it's exactly what we both need in this moment. And that's truly been the biggest challenge for me uh, stepping into 2024 is just learning to slow down after a crazy time. I think one of the tensions, I had a conversation with Craig Rochelle recently about this, but there is that tension between drivenness and resting well. Mm -hmm. And it's because you can, you can go too far on drivenness and you end up burning out. You can go too far on resting well where you lose your edge and then it's like, what, am I retired at 35? Or you know, what does that look like? Uh, I know this is very recent for you, but what are you learning about that? Or let me ask this question. Do you know what's driving your ambition? Ooh, that's a great question. You know, I, my personality, the way I'm wired, I'm an Enneagram 2, and all I want is to have people like me and to be, you know, adored and not be rejected. And so that, for a long time, that was the ambition behind, that was sort of the mask behind wanting to entertain and get the laugh. It was, listen, I'm not the tallest guy in the room. I'm not the smartest or best looking guy in the room. But if I can try to make someone laugh, I can get them to like me. And so for a long time growing up, you know, since I was eight years old, that's what you, you know, these patterns show up in life later on. 
And so now I'm realizing, and I'm hopefully maturing away from the wrong motive of, I just want them to like me. And instead it's, how can I just add value? How can I bring this person a moment of joy without really any motive behind it? I don't care if they like me or not. I just want to serve because I'm wired to serve. That's what I've been trying to move into. There's probably unhealthy moments in certain scenarios where, where you don't do it for the right reason. But I found that I get the most joy, most energy, and least resentment when I do it for those reasons alone of just going, there's no ulterior motive here. And so that's been a learning uh, curve for me. But behind the ambition now, it's become more than me. You know, as you get married, as you become a dad, as you realize that, you know, life is short and family has health problems, you sort of have those, those realization moments where you go, okay, we've done, we've done the thing. We have a great career. We have the money now. What else? And as I talk to finance creators, Carrie, because I'm in that space, I'm realizing uh, the question that has been coming up for me in my mind for those people and for myself is, and then what? Yes. If, right? Like that's such a crazy question to ask is you make a million dollars and then what? You have the vacation home and then what? Because what I've realized is it's never enough for those people. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the scoreboard is always moving. The goalpost is always shifting a little bit because once you have 10 million, you go, what's it going to take to get to 20 million? What would yeah. that do? And I've realized that there's not, there's not much underneath all of that. And that has sort of shaken me to my core. And it, it makes mm-hmm. me thank God that I know him and that I'm a believer because I think a faith underpinning is so crucial to helping ground you to where you don't just float off into space with that mentality of, you know, what's more? What does more even mean? When is enough enough? And then what? And so that's the question I've been asking for myself lately and of other people. Any idea what the answer to that question might be or where the answer is pointing? Well, I think if you go deep enough, it becomes pretty existential. And you start to go like, what is the meaning of life, Carrie? And what am I on this earth to do? And what will have made me look back at my life and go like, that was a life well spent, well done, faithful servant. And so it, it begs those deeper questions, which I think is important. You know, when you start to think about legacy and now that I'm a dad and what am I going to leave in this kid and to this kid? Like those are real questions now that were just hypothetical six months ago. And so I, I truly think the work I've done you know, the impact, I just want to create a ripple effect, I think is is my mm. goal. I'm okay being forgotten because I know, you know, 100 years from now, how many people are going to know who I am? How many people are going to know Carrie Newhoff? Probably a lot more will know Carrie Newhoff 100 no, years from now. I'm, I'm with you on that. But, you know, there's going to be 17 million podcasts out there. We'll just be mm-hmm. one or two of them. And so it sort of helps ground me and keep me humble to go like, I am, I am worthy and I am loved, but if I was gone today, the world would go on without me. Like that is a beautiful posture to take. And there's such a tension in there of feeling like nobody is put on this earth to do what I'm meant to do. And also I'm replaceable. Like God mm-hmm. could use anyone else to be a vessel. And so I think that's such a, a beautiful posture, but also a very troublesome one. And uh, I know we talked about this. You interviewed Dave and he talked about handing over the Dave Ramsey show and making it the Ramsey show and succession and what that means. And so I'm only 34. And so I hopefully have a lot, a lot of time left on this earth, but truly I just think what's the impact I can have today. Cause if I think well, I'm going to have a 40 year impact, it boggles my mind. But I just think, what can I do today that can have a ripple effect into tomorrow, a month from now, a year from now. And you see those stones start to skip that becomes bigger than you. I think that's a beautiful way to look at life. And I'm trying to do that every day. I think it's to your credit that you're asking those questions at 34. Um, I don't think a lot of people get to them until their late 40s or 50s. And some people never get to those questions. So, you know, as you're talking about that, like, yeah, you're debt free and you probably have a little bit of money in the bank, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And now you're like, wait a minute, I was supposed to be working until I was 62 to pay everything off, right? Like that's kind of the world that we're grown up in. And it's really interesting, you know, nine years on this podcast, almost a decade, you can kind of tell what questions I'm asking personally by the questions I'm asking guests. And you reminded me that if you go back, I can't date this exactly, but maybe five or six years ago on the podcast, as I was just entering into my, you know, early to mid fifties, 
I started asking guests who had made it financially, why do you keep working? Why do you keep working? And there are always different answers. And it was a really interesting question as I entered my 50s because I always assumed, well, you work because you have to make money. And then eventually you get to the point where the house is paid off and this is done. And then you're like, well, why do, you, why do people keep working? And I would say, as I've tried to answer that question in my 50s, I've landed in a very similar place to you, which is the word that I think of for the next two decades or beyond is contributing. I want to be contributing. And what that is, it gives my life purpose every day. Right now, it means I can bring great conversations like this one to a good size audience. It means I get to write pieces that hopefully help people in their practical leadership and ministry. It means I get to speak to leaders around the world, uh, doing a lot of global travel this year, and I get to make a difference, hopefully, in some way in their lives. And that brings me a ridiculous amount of joy. And the money's secondary. It just, it doesn't matter as much anymore. Uh, what really matters is the meaning and the purpose behind every day. Does that resonate yeah. at all? No, bit? that's beautiful. Well, and you said mm. a key word there that I want to call out because I think it's what every leader should aspire to. And you kept saying, I get to. Oh, and yeah. And so many people out there, it's, well, I have to. Everything's obligation. Everything mm. is sort of an obstacle to overcome. And you've gotten to a point because of your work ethic over such a, you were just diligent, consistent over a long period of time that you've changed your sentences to, I get to. It used to be, well, I have to go do that speaking gig. I have to go uh -huh. meet with that person. And now it's, I get to go do that speaking gig. I get to do this podcast. And I think that's something that most people aspire to with their finances, with their career, you know, and uh, money, as I see it, has become an obstacle for most people instead of what I want it to be for them, which is a tool a tool that helps them live a life they're not exhausted by, a, a life that they always wish they could have lived and give the way they, they wish they could give. That's the part that people have either lost, they've lost hope that it's possible for them hmm. or they don't know how to do it the right way. They don't know what's next. and They're sort of paralyzed by it. But I love that, that sentence of I get to, because I think Dave Ramsey would say the same thing. He'd be like, I don't have to do yeah. the show. I get to do this. I love doing this. Mm -hmm. I come in every day and, you know, Dave... Dave hasn't had to work in a long, long time. And yes. so the fact that yeah. he shows up every day, takes three hours of calls, goes to all the meetings, runs a huge company is just mind boggling to me. No, it really is, you know, and it was funny because there's nothing like 20 years of ministry to beat any financial goals out of you that you once had. Uh, and it did a really good job of that because it becomes about serving people. And yeah. then when I started this chapter in my life uh, nine years ago, uh, I remember one of the early values I would say to my team is we are never going to be in a position where we have to do something, where I have to take that speaking opportunity because otherwise we can't pay the bills or mm. we have to take this podcast sponsor. We fired podcast sponsors. We've dropped them because we made a mistake on calling who was a good partner. We've left money on the table. And, you know, I think if you have that perspective that, this isn't something we have to do. And don't put yourself in a position where you're doing things that are against your conscience, against your belief, or against even your sense of integrity. No, we're proud of the partners we have on the podcast. I love the speaking events that we get to, uh, to do. And you got there very early in life, much earlier than most people. And hence your new book, right? Breaking Free from Broke, which I want to get into. I want to talk a little bit about money and particularly being young and dealing with money. But before we leave this topic entirely, any other advice to the young leaders listening who are looking for that break that you got or something like that? Any other thoughts about do's or don'ts that they should bear in mind? Mm. Well, I would say that opportunity and success is a lot more about EQ than it is IQ. And too many people you know, we're getting the seventh degrees in college and they're just in this education vortex. Instead of just getting out there and, and learning how to connect with people in a, re in a real way, instead of in a formulaic transactional way, like we're losing that relational component in our society because of the internet and social media. And at the same time, it's easier to connect with people thanks to the internet and social media. So I think learning how to do that well and add value is the biggest thing. And also there's this, concept carry that work is is evil 
there's this anti-work culture and I want to be my own boss and I want to be an entrepreneur and working for the man is evil. And if you're a nine to fiver, you're, you're not, you're never going to build wealth. And I'm here as a nine to fiver, as a W2 employee telling people you can have a great life. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone. Trust me, there's some people who should not be running their own business. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just want to tell them it's okay to not jump to the next thing and the next thing every year. It's okay to just plant roots and commit to something that you believe in. And that's what happened at Ramsey. I've been here 10 years. I've had six jobs. I might be the millennial with the longest standing career at one company. I uh, you know being <laughs> in here 10 years, most people, they're jumping ship every, th every three months for the next gig that pays $1,000 more. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons I'm here is because of my stick to itiveness, where I went, no, I'm, I want to stay here for a long time and build relationships. I mean, some people here I've known for a decade or more now, and it's been a beautiful thing versus restarting at a new company or a new startup just to make an extra buck. And it's one of the reasons I think um, I've found the success and joy that I have in my work is because of just that commitment. And so mm. I think you got to you gotta commit, you got to persevere, you got to be persistent with the right EQ and do it the right way by adding value to leaders and to people that you look up to. And I can't imagine not being successful. That's a foolproof pl plan right there. If that doesn't work, DM me and tell me what went wrong. What are some EQ tips that you see other leaders your age or a bit younger missing? Mm. I think humility is a big part of EQ. If you don't have humility, I think you've already lost. When you come in a room acting a certain way, acting like you know it all, even if you are a prodigy level genius, you're not going to last in that room long. No one's calling you on the weekend to hang out so they can tell you all the things that you got wrong or the, how it could be better. So I think coming at it with humility, with a posture of, you know, an attitude that is yes and is also really important. The EQ leaders that I know, they never just shoot things down. They seek to understand. They really want to know where you're coming from. They value your input instead of kind of make it an afterthought, which is what happens sometimes. Um, when they do speak, they ask really good questions. They never just speak to speak. I mean, Proverbs talks about this. That's what fools do. They just open their mouths. And so I think having something to say and not feeling like you need to fill air because that's how you stand out, that's a, that's a really big one for leaders that I look up to and things that I've been trying to work on. And so I think that's what EQ comes down to. There's a level of humility. There's a level of um, openness to ideas. There's a level of caring to where it's not just, hey, did you get that task done? It's, hey, how are, the, how are the kids doing? How's Mia doing? I know she had that rash. Has that been healing up? Leaders that do that, you're like, oh my gosh, this person's on another level. Like, we get the business done, but can they also be a person and be a friend? And so I think those are the best leaders I've seen. They see that opportunity in someone. They, see, they believe in those people and they have that posture of humility. They ask great questions and it's more than just about work. And those are the people that I've seen win in the long term. You can win in the short term just by being, you know, rock and roll business and getting the numbers, but you don't survive long term if you don't have those qualities. So you wrote a new book. Congratulations. It's a major feat. Absolutely. Thank it's called you. Breaking Free from Broke. How do you angle money? Like there's so many money books out there and Ramsey has a lot. What's different about Breaking Free from Broke? Tell us what makes your book a little bit different than maybe some of the other books that people would have read on money. Well, as you know, the Total Money Makeover is the 800-pound gorilla in the room when it comes to personal finance books. Yep. Over 10 million copies sold. You know, so it's sort of like the canon has been written. And so that yes. posed me with a great challenge to go like, I'm not going to just write a book about the baby steps. That right. has been done. What can I bring to the table that is fresh, that's unique, that's going to connect with new audiences that's going to maybe convince the tribe that has been hanging on to those credit cards for a little longer than they should, even though they mostly follow the Dave Ramsey way. And so I needed to do something really fresh. And I thought, what can I bring to the table? And that was this creatively exposing the system and the villains that are out there from a consumer advocate standpoint and doing it with more research than we've ever done, with more humor than we've ever done, in a more relevant way than we've ever done. Really speaking to where people are at. Having so much empathy that I'm not talking down to you. I'm not yelling at you. I'm just that snarky friend who's telling you the truth. 
and it stings for a second, but then you're laughing and we're having, we're having a drink talking about what the next step is we're going to take. And so, as you know, when you write a book, there's a lot of things you hope for. There's the reviews that you hope come through and like, I hope people understand what I'm saying and that it's not taken out of context or this doesn't come across this way. And I'm, I'm proud to say the reviews have been pouring in and it has been overwhelming. Not just how positive they are, but people that are 17 years old are latching on saying, thank you for helping me avoid mistakes that could have cost me years of, of my adulthood. Then someone who's 51 is on the phone in tears, drawn on my live stream for the book launch saying, I'm 51. I thought there was no hope for me. Thank you for telling me that it's still possible and showing me a way out. And so I didn't want to write a book for a certain, yes, it's going to connect with Gen Z and millennials. So if you're, you know, if you don't connect with old bald white guys, no offense, Dave Ramsey, if you're listening, you know, I thought maybe they'll connect with a, with a younger white guy with hair and hipster glasses. And so it's been really encouraging to see people message me saying, hey, I'm not even three chapters in. I've cut up all of my credit cards. Thank you for showing me how to live without one. Thank you for showing me how to uh, get rid of the student loan or live or go to school without getting one in the first place. And so those kinds of messages give me so much joy and hope that what I wrote on the page is actually connecting in the way I wanted it to. One of the things that is, I think, true, and I'm not a cynic and I have never experienced you as a cynic, George, but the system is kind of designed to keep you broke, isn't it? Like, in what ways is, is that true? I mean, your bank wants to charge you fees. They want to make a lot of money and they want to make sure that you don't quite pay off that balance every month, et cetera, et cetera. And, oh, we can make a 30-year mortgage. No problem. We'll take care of that for you. You know, more interest for them. How yeah. is the system designed to keep you broke and enslaved? Well, Carrie, as I started doing research for this, it was amazing how things started with good intentions back in the day. And so I talk about the path that most of us took, which is, our parents didn't have it amazing. They wanted a better life for us. So they said, get good grades, get a further education, go to college, go to the one of your dreams for the dream degree and take out as much money as you need to make it happen to fund this operation. On the way, we're told, oh, and by the way, you now need a credit score to live your adult life. And to get the credit score, a best way to do it, open the credit card and just put gas and normal lifestyle stuff on it. So now we're racking up credit card debt, hoping to pay it off. We're building our credit score, which involves taking on more debt to get a better score and then playing the game perfectly to get a better score to get more debt, which is insane. Now we're racking up student loans. Oh, and by the way, we can't afford the car that we deserve or that we need or that our parents told us was for safety and reliability. Now we have a car payment stacked on top of that. Then what happens when you graduate? You're like, well, I'm, a, I'm an adult. I'm a college graduate. I need to buy a house. Only poor people rent, Carrie. So I'm, I'm now forced into buying a house even though I'm broke with no savings, ton of debt, no down payment, but I'll just do one of these first-time home buyer programs and put almost nothing down and we'll figure it out later. And so now you're stacked with debt and you're looking at other options to get out of this. So you're looking at HELOCs, which is just more debt tied to your house. Mm -hmm. You're looking at 401k loans, robbing what little retirement you have in order to move debt around. And you're looking at debt consolidation and debt relief and debt settlement. And every word has to do with debt. And that's when I realized debt is a thief. It's stealing from our joy. It's stealing from our paychecks. And it's time to stop. And once I actually went through that process, because I'm not here on a mountaintop from the tower, I had $40,000 in consumer debt. I had the student loans. I had multiple credit cards thinking I was winning. And it left me broke and anxious and cynical toward adulthood. Um, and that was back in 2013, Carrie, right before we mm -hmm. met. Mm -hmm. I was on this journey going, this can't be it. Like this American dream is not it. And what was your total net worth negatively in 2013 oh approximately? I mean, I, I about had nothing in the bank carry. So it was my yeah. debt was, it was negative $40,000. And then you can, you know, plus whatever I had in the bank at any given moment, which was probably enough right. to cover bills and that's it. Yeah. So it was, it was tough. You could have been a caller to Dave Ramsey. Hi. Oh, a hundred percent. I'm 31 30, or 21, 22. Uh, help me out here. He would have said, um, sell your degree. I would have said, too, I can't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> Wish I could. Yeah. Let's talk about credit score because that is something you talk about a lot on the air. So does Dave. So do others. How do you get, and I want to talk about housing and inflation and how expensive everything is and what that makes realistic. For leaders, because you got a lot of ministry leaders here. They're not making big bank um, day to day. Their paycheck isn't as big as it could be if they were in the open market. 
um, credit score. How do you get a house if you don't have any debt to prove that you're credit worthy? Mm. Yeah, this one I have a lot of empathy for because it's the one thing people go, listen, George, I'm on board and I can do the no car payment. I'll pay cash. Yeah. But getting a house, I have to have a credit score. And I thought that way for a long time until it was time for me to buy a house with no credit score. And it was shockingly easy to where I went, oh my gosh, I, was I lied to? Like, why did we perpetuate this myth? And all it and, took was a process called manual underwriting. And so automated underwriting is how most mortgages are written. And it's, you enter in the person's information in the system, it spits out the right. credit score and the lender goes, okay, we can do this. The risk is, is not enough to, to warrant us saying no, give them the loan. With manual underwriting, it takes a real person looking at your tax returns and your utility bills and going, this person has the income to support this. They have a low debt to income ratio and they pay bills on time. So it really was not rocket science to get approved and it really didn't take that long and it didn't cost me more. That's another myth that it's going to cost you way more. I did a 15-year fixed rate mortgage. We had over 20% down and they gave me a great rate back in 2019 when we got our, our mortgage without a credit score. And so I'm here to tell you, I'm not the only one. This isn't like a weird one-off situation because I'm the Ramsey guy. They didn't know or care. And many, many people have done this without a credit score and survived to tell the tale. So that's one of the biggest myths out there. And I've rented cars. I've rented hotels. I've done all kinds of things without a credit score. I have great insurance rates. And so all this mythology, I break it down in the book and I tell people how to live without it with step-by-step -step plans for every single piece because... I was just tired of all the objections. I went, listen, you can't argue with me after this. Hmm. Yeah, and see, that's really interesting. The other thing to pick up on is that you have a paid-for house, but you bought it in 2019. So you just aggressively paid it down quickly. That was the strategy. My wife and I pre-decided by asking some revolutionary questions like, what could we do if we didn't have a house payment in our early 30s? Like, what could that make possible? What kind of options would we have? And so that was our really our driver. And you know, we knew we wanted to have kids one day. Now we have a little girl and she's being raised with a totally debt-free household. And it's just a beautiful thing to not have money fights in the house. And instead, we just get to focus on, hey, how do we want to give this month? How do we want to spend this month? Because we have the margin to do that. And so we didn't do it because Dave Ramsey said, I have to pay off my mortgage in 26 months. No, he would have been happy it. with 15. Exactly. Years. Yeah, 15 or less, he'd be like, all right, you're, you're doing well, my man. And so it was an aggressive goal for us. I know we're weird. And for some people, it's going to take 5, 10, 15 years. But it's amazing. When you do a 15-year fixed rate mortgage, and it's not too much of your world, you end up paying off that mortgage in 15 years, worst case. And you save hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest. So was it rice and beans? Or like, what were some of the strategies that got you to pay it off in 26 months? Well, luckily, you know, when you get to that baby step, it's baby step six in the Ramsey plan. And so you're out of debt. You have an emergency fund. We were investing 15% already into retirement accounts. And whatever money was left over every single month, we would just throw at the house. And it was really simple. We didn't follow any of these like TikTok strategies about how to pay it off early. We just literally paid extra on the principal along with our normal mortgage payment. And we set a goal every month. So maybe it was, hey, this month, we're going to try to put $1,000 extra. And we're going to try to consistently make that payment. And if we can put a 1500 extra the next month, that's going to be even better. And so watching that come down, following a spreadsheet showing us how much less interest we're paying, how much interest we're saving, and our debt payoff goal speeding up, super encouraging. Yeah. And we've seen that. I'm not that special now. We're seeing debt-free screams carry from people in their 20s and 30s who are just living on less than they make, living modestly, still enjoying life, going on vacations, and paying off their house early because they saw their parents struggle into their 60s hanging on to the mortgage and the HELOC and the second mortgage. And they're going, I don't want to live with that kind of stress. Yeah. I know in Canada too, it's a tough thing. I mean, the numbers are very different in Canada. And so I feel, because we're starting to get more calls from Canada, Carrie, God bless y'all. I don't know what's happening over there, but we need you. We need your help. It's a Carrie. little crazy. I'll tell you, it's a little crazy because housing prices are just through the roof. And there's been about a 25% correction over the last few years. But you also bought at a very critical time, 2019, before the craziness of COVID. So I'm, there's thousands of people listening to this right now who haven't purchased. They've never bought a house. They're renting. Rent's gone up to two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month. 
They're trying to save. And now the average house is somewhere between $600,000 and a million dollars, depending on their market. Mm. What, yeah. How has the advice changed over the last few years? Because I find that one to be really tough. And let's take family money out of the equation. Okay, you're on your own. Here are your bootstraps. What advice do you have for people living in the new financial reality? Man, well, I know it's tough, especially for like when I see the Canadian numbers, it truly hurts my heart. Oh, yeah. And it's even harder out there than in America. But, you know, I have a whole section in the home, in the mortgages chapter on this because I have such empathy for that person. I wanted to mm. speak directly to them and say, hey, I know you're a hopeful homeowner and I know it feels more hopeless than ever. And here's the numbers. I'm not trying to downplay it. It's harder than when our parents... Yeah got a house. And oh, I know is. this is not a hate on boomers because houses were cheap and they walked uphill both ways. I understand they had a hard life too. But the numbers are astounding as far as how fast homes have appreciated in value versus how quickly our incomes have appreciated in value. Mm -hmm. So there is one good thing there we can control, our income. We can't yep. control house prices, but if you're making 30000 you might be able to get a side hustle and up it to sixty, or switch career paths entirely. Or maybe you'll be married soon and you'll have dual incomes. How amazing would that be? And so where you are right now is not where you might be three to five years from now. Your income is going to go up. You may get married and have dual incomes. Uh, you can always adjust your expectations. Yes, you might need to go further outside of the city. It's going to be a half hour commute and you can afford the condo or townhome that doesn't mm -hmm. have all the features you want. But get in the game when you financially can. And what that means is you're out of debt, you have an emergency fund, now we're diligently saving up that down payment to where we can get this house the right way. And what I'm seeing, Carrie, is people getting freaked out and they're jumping into houses they can't afford, taking on a half million dollar mortgage because I'll never be able to buy. Well, now they're calling the show saying, should I sell? Because I'm so stressed out. I can't pay all the bills. I still have debt. I can't save for the future. And I'm going, this house was supposed to be a blessing and it's become a real burden. And so it's not worth your, your peace or your patience to jump in a house before you're ready, even if it means it's a 10-year journey for you. Yeah, and I'm definitely, you know, one of the people who is part of the problem or at least, you know, born in a different decade than a lot of listeners. But we bought our first house in 1997. And I don't even want to say what we paid for it because you can't buy a shoebox for that these days. So it's not fair. But that was a lot of money for us. I was making almost nothing in ministry. My wife was working very part-time because we had two young kids, et cetera. And I remember almost all of our furniture was hand-me-down. And when we first got married, it was like, well, we borrowed a sofa from somebody and then we got this coffee table. None of it matched and it wasn't really fancy. And then gradually, little by little over the decades and years, we would just buy some furniture when we had some extra money, et cetera. Do you find that expectations have changed so much because we didn't have social media? I mean, it was only the people. I didn't have an image to project. I didn't have people to impress. And we always drove a little less car than our friends. We had a little less house than our friends. We didn't have as nice of furniture. We didn't take as nice a vacation. But fast forward that kind of discipline, and we did not do it perfectly. But in your 50s, we now have more margin than a lot of the people that we started out with just because we tightened that belt so much in our 20s and 30s. And I'm not claiming we got it all right. We got a lot of stuff wrong. Happy to talk about that on another day. But do you find that the expectations that social media and the whole world looking in on you uh, has probably elevated people's expectations to, well, if it doesn't have the granite countertops and it doesn't have the nice kitchen island and it's not this color, then I don't want it. Oh, man, you're, you're spot on here. I mean... I have a lot of empathy for those people because HGTV ruined us. And thanks, Chip and Joanna, for making us expect way too much. Our standard of living has increased. I mean, yeah. we all now need an iPhone. Every two years, yes. we need the newest iPhone because ours doesn't work as good. Mm -hmm. And so you just think about that alone. Plus, we can't live in the old, you know, the nasty old shiny wood grain walls. We need updated you know, we need aesthetic carry. We need to have a peaceful environment and a nice mm -hmm. environment. And I'm not shaming people for having that standard of living, but you got to understand where your parents are at today could take you 20 to 30 years to get to. Well, that's what we expected. I mean, I thought, hey, maybe in our 50s, we'll have the stuff we really want. And in between then, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. Now it came a little bit earlier than that, but still. Yeah, I've, I found we, we just had no expectation of having anything nice for years when we were first married. 
That's a hard one to do. And you're right. Social media has made it worse because back in the yeah. day, you only knew what your neighbor was driving. And now on Instagram, I know where Carrie's been last weekend. And you just mm-hmm. see the grill. He's got that nice big green egg and he was just in Cabo. And oh my gosh, how is he affording <laughs> that? Are they deeply in debt? Are they doing really well? And it's this comparison culture that we yeah. live in. And you know, your inputs really matter. Those mm-hmm. social media inputs, whatever you're watching, listening to, comparing your life to, it's never healthy. No one has ever looked at someone else's life. Because here's one thing, uh, you'll either go, and I think Craig Rochelle has a great quote on this, it'll either make you feel superior or inferior. Mm-hmm. That's the problem with comparison. And so you either go, wow, we're not doing as bad as Carrie, or man, it's not fair, they're doing so well. I mean, isn't he like a pastor? You know, there's all these kinds of questions that bubble up that really just point to our own human ugliness and selfishness. So it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy to turn down those inputs and turn off the comparisons, but I will say your life is so much better when you don't care what other people think. That is a superpower in today's world to not have that be a part of your your day-to-day of comparing your life to others. And I think it's really hard to get to. That takes a real place of maturity and wisdom to be okay driving the crappy car because you're working on paying off the debt. And your mm-hmm. friends are going to give you crap for it. And you either find new friends or you tell them, you laugh it off and go, yeah, yeah I'm doing this Ramsey plan. Make fun of me all you want, but I got no payments. You know, that's mm-hmm. the real flex, mm-hmm. I think. As, we, mm-hmm. as these generations come up, the new flex is going to be, I got no payments. And right mm-hmm. now the flex is, look at all the stuff I have, even if it means I'm secretly drowning in debt and stress. That's the problem. We're not mad at nice stuff. We, you know, when we say rice and beans, people think we mean forever. No, the quote is, Live like no one else, so later you can live and give like no one else. Sacrifice mm-hmm. now so you can have a big, beautiful tomorrow down the road. And so our, the Ramsey plan is two years of sacrifice so we can have the next 30 years of peace and no payments and options and margin and meaning and joy. And uh, that, that part has been misconstrued, and I think delayed gratification is at the core of that. And if my generation, if older generations, younger generations, if we could all grasp that concept of delayed gratification, we would be in a much better place emotionally and financially. The other thought I've, I've read recently, and I forget, it could be James Clear, it could be Morgan Housel or someone I just can't think of in the moment, but it's like envy is a problem. I mean, it's a sin. You and I share the same faith. It's a sin, et cetera. But if you're going to envy someone or want what they have, you should think, do I want their entire life? Mm. Because what you're enjoying, you're enjoying their car or their house or their condo or their vacation or uh, their food processor or whatever it is. So you're, you're envying a little tiny slice or their work ethic or the fact that they just published a book or whatever that is. But the question is, would you sign up for their whole life? Because that might have come at a great cost. That could come at a relational cost. That could come at a personal cost, great sacrifice. There could be a whole lot of stuff way out of whack that you don't even know about. And I thought that's a really good thing. Like choose your heroes carefully. Choose the people you follow carefully. Any other thoughts on money tips for next gen folks? Mm. Well, I opened the book with a, with a great C.S. Lewis quote that I think sums it up, and it's all about swimming upstream. Um, I think I have the... Do you have the book behind I you, I got Carrie? it right here. Yeah, okay. let me see. There's read Dave's it to me because I want to hear from Carrie's voice. I will voice. read it to you. I'll read it to you. I'll do the narration. Carrie, read C.S. Lewis. Oh, I see Voltaire, uh, Voltaire in... That's another one of my favorite quotes. One. Is it in front of Dave's? It's oh, yeah. in the introduction. Yeah. It's called Average Sucks. Of course, that's what Dave Ramsey wrote. But here it is. When the whole world is running toward a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. C.S. Lewis. That sums it up right there. I feel like a crazy person in today's world, Kerry, posting on social media saying, hey guys, the credit card companies are not your friend. You should cut them up and stick to using your own money and paying now. And they're all like, kill him. No, (laughs) he's coming after our credit cards. I mean, I'm like, you would think I'm coming after their, their freedoms as Americans, Kerry. And so the aggressiveness toward, you know, just becoming sheep and just wanting to, you know, be blessed by these debt companies is outrageous to me. And so when I tell people to live counterculturally and, you know, which I feel like is what the Bible calls us to with our life. And part of that is with our money is to go against the grain and be transformed. Um, And so a big part of that is going, is the system 
really blessing my life? Is it going to allow me to make the kingdom impact I want to make by being over leveraged, by playing this game, by having payments? And I found in every scenario, every situation, nobody's ever been blessed by having to pay monthly payments. And this happens with personal finances. It happens with churches. You know, my, my church that I go to, they acquired $7 million in debt as they merged with another church. And they decided, hey, we're paying a million dollars to a lender every year with the payment and interest. What could we do with an extra million dollars if we didn't have this payment? And they, they challenged the congregation and some of the, the leaders and they went, we're gonna pay this thing off. And Carrie, they did it in a year. They paid off $7 million in a year. And now the church has so much margin and options. They're creating ministries for foster care families. They're creating automotive repair shops for single moms to gift them new cars. And they have uh, wraparound ministries for addiction. And there's all these amazing things that we're able to do because we don't have debt. And so even in the faith space, the leadership space, the personal finance space, it just gives you more margin and options and peace when you don't owe anyone money. And so the book is there to convince you that number one, it's possible for you, regardless of your age. Then number two, you can rise above the broken system. And number three, that your life's gonna be so much better because of it, regardless of what culture is telling you. What is the hope for that 51-year-old who came in on the live show in tears? Like we've got some who haven't read the book. Most people haven't read the book, obviously. What would you say to the 51-year-old or the 61-year-old who's still got the HELOC, the home equity line of credit, the mortgage, probably went into more debt to help their kids get an education, their kids are in debt, and who maybe don't make a lot of money? You know, they're in ministry. What would you say to those people who are listening? Mm. Well, I'd say a few simple things, and it may sound trite coming from a 34-year-old, but you know, people call us from all over the world and they trust us with their questions regardless of my age and experience and background. But after help, helping many people on the air, here's what I found resonates the most. Number one, I tell them, it's not all your fault, but it's your responsibility. And the sooner we can drop the victim mentality and the victim baggage and pick up this victor mentality that I believe God has instilled in each one of us, the sooner we can have that freedom. And number two, it's not too late. Your past and your mistakes and your age and, well, I'm close to retirement and I haven't saved anything. Well, the best time to plant the tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. And so what are we going to do today instead of wallowing in shame and regret and baggage and mistakes? Because we've all been there. If you're over 12, that makes you an adult who's made some money mistakes. (laughs) And so it's okay, but you can't just keep beating yourself up. Instead, you got to go, what's the right next step? So it's not all your fault, it's your, but it's your responsibility. It's not too late, and there is hope for you yet. And I know that because I've seen it. I see the 60-year-old call in and say, we just got a hold of this plan at 55. My husband and I have paid off our mortgage, and we're going to be able to retire with dignity now, thanks to you guys. And we say, we didn't do, you did the hard work, not us. We're not the heroes. And so it's a, it's a beautiful reminder of the agency and autonomy we have over our financial destiny and what is possible when we truly are willing to transform, when we're truly, we want to have that paradigm shift. We're going to believe something different about ourselves and the world. We're going to act differently. That gives you this magical thing called hope. And I think it's what the world is begging for right now. Well, the book is called Breaking Free from Broke, The Ultimate Guide to More Money and Less Stress. It's available everywhere. George, I am so grateful for you. And There's a lot of other areas we could have gone into, but we'll save that for round two down the road. If people want to track with you and all the awesome things you are doing, where is the easiest place for them to connect with you now? Absolutely. Well, I'm always hanging out on Instagram at George Camel. That's K-A-M-E-L, like the animal. Love connecting with folks on there, especially your amazing listeners. I I have a deep affinity for your show in particular, Carrie, and your listeners they're amazing leaders out there and uh, you've been doing such a great job. And if they want to check out the book, it's in bookstores as well, RamseySolutions.com. And we even made it to Canada, Carrie. I'm proud to say people are hey. posting pictures from Indigo bookstores saying, hey, I got the book. It's on the shelf. And so I, the principles will apply. The, the actual scenarios and data points may be a little different, but I think the heart of the message will still resonate regardless of where you live in the world. And it's been so fun launching this thing. And Truly, it's, it's the Dave's generosity of his platform that he's built and given to us so freely. So mm. it's been a fun ride. Well, 
Congratulations, George. Thanks for helping us get started in those first few fledgling years of this podcast. And it's just an honor to have you as a guest who's accomplished so much over the last decade. Appreciate you a lot, man. And got a lot of good things to come. Thank you, Kerry. You've been a great friend and I've always believed in you from day one. I went, this guy's going somewhere and look at you now. <laughs> Thanks, George. Thanks, Kerry.